Hello, Infinite Antonies here. I'm taking you behind the curtain, uh, the wizard's curtain today. I'm going to show you under the hood how Cubase and OBS hang together. And we have this horribly cluttered screen because we need to talk a lot about OBS today. So it's going to have to be on my main monitor. And therefore there are infinite me's and infinite Focusrite audio interfaces. I'm going to go through the entire chain showing you how to get sound out of Cubase into OBS, record it, process it, send it through um, Adobe and get to a point where you've got a good volume level ready for uploading to something like YouTube in my case. So we're going to start off today with the microphone. Here it is. This is plugged into input three of my Focusrite and here it is coming in. You can see, as you can see, as I talk, the input level on this is green. I'm not dipping yellow. I'm never really uh, in any danger of going too hot on the microphone. It's worth a quick mention of how the microphone's set up as far as I'm concerned. I use the control room in Cubase. This is kind of a very small detour and I won't spend long on it. But basically I use the control room. I need to hide me, don't I? So then I can add audio effects. You can see I've got a de here, trimming off some of that sibilance. I've got a compressor, so if I just briefly talk a little bit too loud, it just trims some of those peaks off. This EQ over here, by the way, is a weird quirk of my home. Uh, I have solar panels and they emit a high-pitched sound at 20 kilohertz. It's a, a flaw, actually, with the inverter. Uh, so I have to have this EQ just trimming off everything over 17k. If you're very young, you will appreciate that. I can't hear it. Uh, I had to get somebody else to tell me that that was a problem. But the bottom line is I've got my microphone signal nice and healthy in um, in the control room. You can see all of these signals are nice and nice and strong. Coming out of there, they're going to go straight to the stereo output uh, of Cubase. Let's just minimize me a little bit. Here it is over here. You can't even see the microphone on the primary stereo out, but it will be going there. And ultimately get into the audio interface. The reason for using the microphone is that I can then have the song running in the background and have completely independent control of the song with my microphone over the top and all sorts of monitoring of the control room because that's exactly what that feature is all about. So I've got this ability to mix those two sounds together inside Cubase before it gets to the outside world. So where does that signal get to? Well, it actually gets to these two inputs in my um, audio interface. You can see these cables coming out of the back of it. This is because Cubase um, uses a system called ASIO to effectively grab the sound card. The audio that comes out of Cubase isn't typically present or available to any other application. So OBS, which is listening for any sound that's happening on my system, can't hear Cubase. I therefore take an output from Cubase coming out of outputs three and four. Let's have a quick look at this. Here's outputs three and four. They're active. They come in to inputs one and two, which are these described as main door one and two. They're not visible or usable by me in any respect. Cubase doesn't care about any of this at all. The most important thing is that these two inputs are different as far as focus rights concerned. Other audio interfaces might be different, but as far as focus rights concerned, Inputs one and two, the analog inputs here, are different and important. They are your microphone inputs. And ultimately, that's what's going to get to OBS. Let's have a look at that. So down at the right hand, bottom right hand corner, the reason why we've got the taskbar, I don't usually have the taskbar visible, because if I cut video out, I don't like the time jumping on, but this is not a time for all of that nonsense. Here it says microphone is in use by OBS Studio. If we click the little speaker icon, uh, and then head into select a sound output. Can you see this little button just to the right of the volume slider? And then critically more volume settings. Why it's so hidden in Windows, I don't know. Here we have all of our sound options. And if I scroll down far enough, here are my input um, settings. Analog one and two are the Focusrite USB audio. So that's my audio interface. Analog one and two inputs are different. You can see four inputs here. They are not all the same. One and two are dedicated, kind of assigned 
to Windows as your microphone inputs. From that point onwards, this volume slider down here is also really important. Can you see that it's set to 50? Let's make sure you can see everything. In OBS, we have these little yellow lights. I don't know whether to point to mine or, <laughs> it really doesn't matter, does it? Okay, so these two tiny lights to the left of the audio meter are basically telling you what this level is here. If I turn this volume up too loud, they're gonna go red and I'm gonna, I'm gonna start distorting, regardless, regardless of the fact that no other meter anywhere in my system is telling me that I'm overloading, that the, the, the audio level is clipping. So make absolutely sure that this value, which I have set at 50, never makes these lights turn yellow. I'll turn it up to 100 briefly, and then you'll see and hear this clipping occur. So if I turn this up far enough, at some point around, there we go. So we're clipping at 70. But can you see, or when I say clipping, we're in the red. The problem is that when this clips, you can bring your output levels down so that your master level isn't clipping, but your input still is. Look at that, boo. That can cause a problem. If those are red and you don't spot it, you're going to have, in fact, this probably sounds horrible, this audio. Let's turn it back down to 50. Up at 100, it really is, you know, hugely boomy. Let's do it very, very briefly. Boom, boom, boom. Very nasty indeed. Back down to 50. So you've got your input level set right now, and OBS is green or yellow. Those are the colors that you want to see. You never really want to see red at all anywhere. That's just a good general principle. And so we're done setting our microphone up. We can shut that down. Onto the next part of the process, we need to make sure that the audio signal inside OBS is also healthy. Now this involves a lot of twiddling with me, just setting all of my audio levels. Can you see these input levels on the focus, right? I have, um, I have the ability to, to adjust both the input gain from here and the output gain in my focus right now, I happen to choose uh, because there are just so many different levels that you can set. You can really easily get yourself confused. If you can safely set something to maximum and it never really causes a problem, then that's a good thing. So my focus right output from analog three and four, remember that loopback system that we've got, this is sending a full signal out of the um, jacks at the back of the interface and back into the front. So I can effectively ignore that loopback system that's operating at maximum power. So now I have to worry about the audio levels inside my um, OBS capture. So I can adjust this up and down and that's gonna be getting quieter and louder. Everything that I'm doing is gonna be having an impact on what you hear because we're, you know, we're recording this live session. So generally speaking, I can actually have this set to maximum because I'm controlling my kind of primary level from the input gain, which was my microphone setting that you saw earlier. So now, as you can see, my when I'm talking to you, I'm comfortably in the yellow. If I get the piece of music playing as well, that's quite quiet at the moment. I can talk over the top of it. Those two things aren't getting in their way, in each other's way, and nothing is clipping. I'm checking my input levels on the focus right. That's not going red. I'm checking my input levels on OBS. That's not going red and my output level on OBS is also nice and safe. So at that point, I've basically like finished producing this video. Let's say that's the point at which I'm going to stop. Now I need to open Adobe um, Premiere and edit this video. Hello, back for part two. So I've just processed the Adobe Premiere file and now I'm ready to get it to the right level because everything that I did in Cubase there in part one was all very safe, largely in the green, sometimes in the yellow, never getting into the red. If you record something like that, particularly if it's spoken word, when you upload it to YouTube, it's gonna to be too quiet. In fact, I can prove that very easily. I'm gonna pick up the processed video now with all of the cuts and edits taken care of. So this is the final version of the video that ordinarily I would release. Okay, so as you can see, for the most part, it's pretty quiet. There's where I increased the microphone level and deliberately distorted. That bit there is gonna be where it's peaking quite heavily. 
Let's have a quick look at the audio statistics. The loudness level for this is going to be way off the minus 14 target I'm really aiming for to get it released to YouTube. Minus 14 uh, loudness units, full scale or LUFs. Uh, you can go and look up that as a separate thing if you need to. It's basically the standard to which most video, particularly for YouTube's purposes, is targeted. And my integrated loudness is minus 25.5, so it's way off. Now, depending on your kind of level of quality control, there's a couple of processes that you can apply to this. You can apply simple um, loudness normalization. If I press N on my keyboard, you can um, do loudness no normalization minus 13. I had it set to 13.9 when I was just testing in preparation for this video, but typically you set it to minus 14 and click apply. And this is for the most part going to work. It's an approximation, but it generally speaking is gonna do the job. As you can see, it's made the vast majority of the video much louder. If you used simple clip gain, this stuff at the top would horribly distort before you got to the stage where anything else was any, like, you know, reasonably sensible. And if we have a look at the statistics, you can see that uh, we will have hit the loudness target of minus 14 LUFs. But we have true peak issues and we have stuff where clearly the signal has clipped. Let's quickly dive into the graphical analyzer and it's really not bad. I mean, it looks very bad when you look at it from this perspective and you think, oh, good grief. You know, there's colossal clipping there. When you look at it, you know, obviously there is clipping because there are so many, it's absolutely exactly zero. And this is where you're going to be getting your intersample peaks from as you kind of draw the imaginary um, little bit of curve at the top of these lines. That's where your distortion is coming from. Generally speaking, this is going to work for the most part. If you want a one-click solution that gets you there very quickly, then this is a way to go about it. And it's kind of, like I say, largely acceptable. You can do that. So I've just undone that process. I've gone back to the original audio as um, first introduced. The second alternative, the, 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 the cleaner approach, if you like, is to use a proper mastering tool. Now, there's a weird thing with Ozone. Ozone 9, for this purpose, is better than later versions. I don't really want to get too deep into Ozone today, but you can basically have it analyze the entire audio and output something that's completely clean. And my system can't hear Cubase. I therefore take an output from Cubase coming out of outputs three and four. Let's have a quick look at this. This is Here's weird. outputs three and four. <laughs> They're active. They come in to inputs one and two, which are these described as main door one and two. They're not visible or usable by me in any respect. Cubase doesn't care about any of this at all. The most important thing is that these two... So what's happened there is I've, I've had Ozone listen to my video, work out some mastering presets. You get a little bit of EQ and dynamic EQ here. The most important component though is the maximizer. I would set the true peak to minus one dB. I would set this learn threshold on, uh, go back to the beginning of the project, press play and have Ozone listen to the entire project. It will then come out with an absolutely perfect minus 14 LUFS target with no intersample peak issues whatsoever. So if you wanna use a mastering tool, this is just one example of how to go about it. The reason why I quite like Ozone 9 is because it's hands-free. I don't particularly want to perform mastering in terms of, you know, very fine optimization of the audio. I just want it to set to minus 14 LUFs with no clipping or intersample peaks. This is a way to do that. But essentially, this last part of the process is really how far do you want to go to get that volume absolutely perfect. And if you really want to go the extra mile, this is the way to do it. So what I'm going to do now is go back and edit this second part of the video, add it to the first part, then do my volume normalization. At this part of the process, I can't go back and show you that, or we'd, be, we'd end up in some sort of infinite loop hell. But essentially, you've seen me approaching the minus 14 LUFS target, 
that final output file that I export from Cubase. Let's just have a quick look at that. I'm going to export the video and I'm going to say just replace the audio in the video. When I say replace audio, that's going to output yet another MP4 file. And that one is the one that I will finally upload to YouTube. And that's everything for today. Hope you've enjoyed the video, found it useful. If you have, uh, please hit like. Don't forget uh, to subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. I'll see you next time. Thanks very much.